Um, first, let me welcome Claire Hurst. She is the uh, director of Navigating Fatherhood Program, uh, Community Credible Messenger Initiative. She works with folks, people who are living on the margins of our communities. More recently, she has been working in the restorative justice community in transforming the lives <clears throat> of adolescent incarcerated parents, youth living in state residential facilities, returning to family community, and the chronically uh, street subway homeless. Claire uses healing practices through mentorship with credible messengers who have walked a similar path to her current clients and are able to speak in concrete terms about how they navigated the system they are currently working through. The mentoring programs uh, provide powerful tools and information for incarcerated dads to begin pre preparing to reintegrate themselves into the lives of their children and communities, and also for young people returning home and their parents to find their purpose, thereby avoiding the robust school to the prison pipeline. Please welcome Claire Hurst. Next, I'd like to welcome Lawrence Bartley, who is the director of the News Inside, uh, which is part of the Marshall Project. Lawrence is the director of News Inside for the Marshall Project. He holds an advanced degree in professional studies from New York Theological Seminary and a Bachelor of Science from Mercy College. He serves as a board, of, uh, a board of Directors member for the Prisoner Legal Services and Rehabilitation through the Arts. He also serves on the advisory board for the Parole Preparation Project and Panacea Video. Previously, Lawrence co-founded Forgotten Voices and its successor, Voices from Within, which highlights remorse, redemption, and alters perception through video presentations. Lawrence is an accomplished public speaker and has provided multimedia content for the New York Emmy-winning three-part series Drama in the Big House. He also was more recently seen uh, at the town hall meeting that was hosted uh, by Lester Holt right here at Sing Sing on MSNBC that aired about a week and a half ago. Um, he was one of the panelists there. Um, he's also done things with NPR and WNYC and, and all kinds of uh, TED Talks and important um, ways to, to uh, connect with people. So please welcome Lawrence Bartley. Our final panelist is someone very familiar to Lawrence. It is um, in her own right. She is. She does some wonderful things, but she also happens to be married to Lawrence. This is Ramin uh, Simmons Bartley. She is a, uh, an advisor to the Parole Preparation Project. She's also a board member with the Sing Sing Prison Museum. And with uh, her dedication to children, uh, Ramin Simmons Bartley started working for the Department of Education in March of 1998. Um, she's received her master's degree in psychology while monitoring uh, while minoring in education and has received her master's um, in school administration and supervision. Renine has served on several boards, including the St. St. Museum and advisor on the Pro Preparation Project. She has been part of several initiatives. One of them um, is, involved, uh, is her involvement um, for change in meeting um, with New York City's uh, Chancellor's Office and initiating um, or working with a program that was initiated by the Director of Youth and Development um, for the New York City Department of Education to implement policy and procedure to teachers and other staff members when dealing with children whose parents or close family members are incarcerated. Renine has also was also selected to be a panel participant in the Jacob Burns Film Center and was featured on Death, Sex, and Money's podcast in August of 2017 and August of 2018. She continues to love, support, and motivate children, her family members, her uh, Alani, Alani, New York sisters, am I pronouncing that right? Alini. Alini, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And uh, Odd Wives, uh, most important, she's a devoted wife and mother. Please welcome Renine simmons Barton. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, uh, you can um, be, be ready for it. We'll come up with our microphone later on. If you'd like to write down a question or something you'd like to uh, have expressed, we can bring you a pencil and paper. Just raise your hand and let us know. Um, I always like to start with um, an opening question that uh, allows our uh, panelists to just uh, have their voice heard and for you to understand their perspective. But there is so much in this film, it's hard to really narrow down um, what piece of it is going to speak most to you. Uh, 25 years ago, I used to work in a group home for adolescent boys, so that end part, watching um, Trey uh, in, that, in that environment was very familiar to me, as was the range of experiences that these kids are having and that their families are having. Um, perhaps you could just share with us what piece of this film um, uh, spoke to you most profoundly or uh, after watching this film, what are you, what are you thinking? What, what is sticking with you the most in this in this moment? 
And uh, I think it's unfair that I got the, the mic first, <laughs> <laughs> since we've got a tight team over here. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, so this film was really, uh, what really st stuck out for me is um, this whole uh, school to prison pipeline and um, just the cycle that, um, that, is, that we see. Uh, the work that I'm doing in restorative justice speaks to all of the, um, the aspects of what we saw tonight. The incarcerated father, who is um, sometimes powerless to uh, have any kind of um, direct involvement in the child or influence in the child's life, as well as the child who is now in, um, under supervision and living in group homes. So <clears throat> the programs that, um, that I work with um, really are about interrupting, right, and intervening early enough in a child's life so that they don't continue on, um, on that pipeline, uh, that we can kind of create a different trajectory in their life. Um, so what really spoke to me was the importance of early intervention um, with effective um, tools and compassionate um, approach. Thank you. Um, Trey's story really stood out to me. He had so many um, tough circumstances in his life from so many different angles, and that would explain why his behavior was so mercurial. Um, uh, I only wish I would have saw it through to the end and see what actually happened in his life. I wish he had more positive role models in his life, someone that's a strong figure. His dad was, he, he obviously had um, a lot of affection for his dad, and I believe if his dad was out, uh, things would have been much better for him. So um, I wonder, I really, I'm left wondering how this story turned out. There were two things that impacted me the most. Um, it was heavy for me. The movie in its entirety was really heavy. Um, Trey's story really brought me back to the reality of children whose parents are incarcerated. Um, being a parent of children whose father was incarcerated, my experience was totally different. Um, I think that my experience was totally different because I was sensitive to the fact of the systemic effect um, of people being incarcerated, especially people of color. But what left me with some relief was the sign because although his father wasn't um, present, his mother seems like she was doing a really good job with him. And they showed more of the positive that can happen although a parent is incarcerated. Right. Um, nobody wants to be the first question. Everybody wants to be the last question. So <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll just uh, offer this. Um, Mace, Mason, the um, child who's uh, lived with his grandmother and his um, mother was living in California. Uh, more recently than this, uh, we have an update to his family situation, which is unfortunately not what we want it to be. Um, his father's green card expired while he was in prison. So um, he can't be released on bond while he's waiting for his um, court date. So he's in, locked up uh, with ICE. And so now Mason's interactions with his father are through glass. He can't have any physical interaction with his father. And then when he's released, he will just be put on a plane and shipped back to the UK. Uh, so uh, I mentioned that there is actually some action you can take if you would like to. On, um, if you didn't get to take action now when you came in, I hope you will take one on your way out. Uh, and there is a, um, under the donate section, there's a GoFundMe. And that GoFundMe is for Mason and for his dad. Um, it's going to be particularly difficult for his father to um, 
reintegrate into a life in a country that he hasn't lived in in a very long time and where his mother is not. He doesn't have strong family connections and will be just as difficult to find employment in the UK as it would have been if he were able to come home to Rhode Island where he could have lived with his mother and, um, and gotten on his feet that way. So the GoFundMe is to help him have um, some financial stability and also to allow Mason to visit his father in the UK. So if you, uh, if you want to follow more of his story, there is, um, we'll, we'll post the article that we learned about this from on our social media. So uh, does anybody have anything more uplifting? Because I, <laughs> I, could, I could use a, um, a more uplifting story. I have something. Please, Renee, please, Greg, get, grab, grab the mic to, to cheer us up a little bit. Give us some, something to be optimistic about. I would like to share um, that every kid or every child whose parent is incarcerated does not um, have these outcomes necessarily. Um, my personal experience was at Sing Sing um, in the last nine years of Lawrence's incarceration was one of people who stuck together. It was one of women who had professional jobs, careers, and that kept that family connection together. Um, it was one that if they felt that their child needed therapy, the child got therapy. Um, unfortunately, the resources are limited still to families because a lot of the focus is on the people who are incarcerated. Um, but my story and a lot of other women's stories is that we are holding it together. Yes, it's difficult, but we are citizens who pay our taxes, who own our homes, and who are productive citizens and we just need people to realize that, yes, we are affected by this, but we don't want to walk around with shame, right? We want to walk around and we want to change the narrative of what it looks like to be a family member um, of someone who is incarcerated. I guess I'll break the ice. Um, I'm, I teach in a high school, and uh, I'm curious how schools support kids who may have uh, family May I have your attention, please? The library will be closing in a half hour. Please note that the computers will be shutting down in about 15 minutes. Please save all your work. But how schools support, if they even know. I know that I had a student who graduated um, just this past spring, and Unbeknownst to me, her father was incarcerated, and it came up in kind of a rather unfortunate way where someone was sort of making fun. And, uh, you know, I was really taken aback by the news. I mean, I, you know, this child, you know, very well adjusted, wonderfully social, you know, bright, very productive, active kid, involved in clubs and stuff like that. But I just wonder how schools play a role in, in the kids' lives. Um, I can speak for, I can only speak for New York City, <laughs> um, New York City Public School, um, and being employed with the Department of Education for 22 years, I can say that there is really no specific programs that are out there for children that are incarcerated. Um, it may be under an umbrella, but there aren't enough programs. Um, you know, children, in my experience, will find a person, usually, that they trust and will kind of let it out, so to speak. And um, we are not, as educators or anyone really working in the system, we are not equipped to really deal with it because we're subjective. A lot of us come with subjective views about prison. To uh, piggyback, sorry, to piggyback, I think um, the bigger discussion is breaking down the stigma around incarceration and, and what that means for the person who is incarcerated and the family that is outside, who's also oftentimes living um, sometimes in secrecy 
because of what that stigma means for their lives. So if we can um, break down the stigma, then it allows for conversation to happen for children who are struggling with the reality of a parent incarcerated um, to seek out uh, help um, with an individual, you know, whether it's a guidance counselor or a teacher that they trust or even, a, you know, another parent. Um, but the, the issue is stigma. Um, I, I'm, I don't, I, I'm not getting your name. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to piggyback on something she, she'd spoken about earlier from the aspect of the, the parent who is in community um, and keeping the household together while, while um, the spouse is incarcerated. One of the things that um, I do, because I don't have an incarceration history, but one of the things that I find in, is my role is opening doors for people who have been incarcerated to come out and find gainful employment, to come out and be credible messengers in the lives of young people. Um, oftentimes what we do is um, we see the person uh, as the crime that was committed. So that person who's spent 20 years or 10 years doing a lot of internal work, the hard work, to come to terms with what they might have done, um, to do a lot of programming, a lot of um, seeking, a lot of reading, a lot of processing. That person, and a lot of, oftentimes they come out with bachelor's and, bachelor and um, master's degrees. They come out of incarceration different people or evolved. And um, when we're able to break down the stigma, when we're able to see the individual in front of us, then we're able to, um, offer them opportunities that helps them to reintegrate into community in a way that is restorative. Um, and, and that, I think, also has a huge impact on their lives as well as their families' lives. I have, um, when, um, I don't want to pronounce your, your name wrong. Rani. Rani. Yes. I had a nephew whose father was incarcerated. And when you make the statement, it takes a family. It definitely takes a family and a village to help that kid get through. And now that his father is out, he's paying for it. He works down at Sing Sing. And he is one who helps the men transition out into the community and to get you know reunited with the kids and it is a village you have to and the stigma that these men and these women had that's the hardest thing because it's like doing the prison time all over again and if I can tell you I I lived it it's not it wasn't my husband or my boyfriend, but it's my husband's brother. So it is a community, and if we could get rid of that stigma, that would make it more better for these kids. Because you have so many kids that's going through it secretly, and they need help with the community. So I don't mean to, to um, hog the mic, <laughs> but I, I think there's also another conversation that's important, which is, um, the societal um, issues and challenges that lead to incarceration. So oftentimes people um, who are incarcerated had someone who was incarcerated or, or had lived through some kind of early childhood traumatic experience that is unresolved. And so that stuff gets compiled and compiled. And oftentimes those are the things that are ruling the decisions that they make. Um, which then lead to incarceration, and I saw that very clearly in um, the young man's life, uh, Trey, Trey's life. Um, and so that's something that I think um, we as a community and as a village um, can be aware of, that when we see behavior, there's something behind the behavior. There's pain behind the behavior. There's an experience or multiple experiences behind the behavior that oftentimes they didn't have control over. 
um, that happened to them that they're now trying to deal with. Um, and, and so conversation, I think, uh, is important around those things. Um, Lawrence, can you tell us a little bit about your experience um, working with uh, other fathers um, on the inside as well as uh, transitioning back out? And uh, I'll let you decide what piece of that is most, uh, most important for us to hear. Well, um, just today, a friend of mine was released um, this morning. And, and I'm reminded of his experience on the inside. He has uh, two children, and he was estranged from his child's mom, but he wanted to be in his child's life. So he, he's a very smart guy, and uh, he's he, he's like his own attorney. He learned how to be an attorney in there. And I, I met him when he was just 29 years old, and since then he was um, petitioning the court to get visitation rights from his, his, his son, and, and he finally got it. And, um, it was so many snafus with the with the uh, video conferencing it wasn't happening and wasn't his fault and he was he was writing all kind of motions to rectify the problem and it just it spoke to his passion and wanting to be in his, his child's life and he did what what I did when I was um when when I was incarcerated I should save portions of my pay and it would accumulate and so around Christmas time I could buy my daughter something for Christmas and for birthdays, and he would do the same thing. So him and I became fast friends. But because of that, um, I recommended that he be part of the Osborne Association. They had a, a, a sort of a think tank for, for, for parents with, with, um, with of children, with incarcerated parents, the, the think tank surrounding those issues. And, um, and we were tasked with trying to um, communicate with the Board of Ed in order to be involved in a child's life, and when report cards get issued, like we try to get report cards sent to the um, fathers that are inside. We we're trying to use video conferencing at least three times a year, or during the market period of time, to have video conference conversations with the parents, uh, with the teachers, uh, trying to get kids education. And um, with that, there was you know there's some stigmas. You know, people were um, were a little reluctant to do it were afraid that other teachers would whisper about their child, find a child's back, and would turn into something where the kid was stigmatized. And, and my biggest fear was that to believe that um, school administrators and, and teachers would believe that the children were less than because their parents were incarcerated and cognitively less than. So therefore, they'll give them um, a little bit of work and, and get them a pat on the back when they halfway tried, as opposed to challenging them and to become smarter, because the person is not going to be, become smarter and, and fulfill them to their greatest self if they're not challenged all the way. So um, those talks um, continued for quite some time, and many principals came in, and um, many, um, some people from the mayor's office came in, New York City's mayor's office, some judges, you know, to try to rectify the problem. And this friend I'm talking about, he was, he was really good at it, you know, and, um, and, and he's a great dad. Today is the first day in, in seven years that he's going to spend a night with his daughter and his son in the same day. I belong to an organization called Asani Prison Ministry. And, for, uh, and we do two things at Sing Sing. And one is uh, we serve a a minimal but very nice breakfast to uh, visitors. The second is that uh, we go into the visiting room and attempt to make sure that the children have something uh, meaningful to do so that they uh, have a pleasant, uh, uh, that they have good, you know, a good visit is, is, my, is my aim. And uh, I've been doing this for I don't know, 20 or 30 years, and I go in almost every Saturday. And I will say that some of some of my best friends are there. I love it. It's the visiting room is very, very different at Sing Sing than it was shown in the film. I was actually very moved by this uh, this film because 
I don't see the children outside of the setting of the visiting room. So this was a whole different view of the children. The visiting room in Sing Sing is very structured. Everyone sits at um, card tables. That's, that's what they are. And uh, there are guards surrounding the room, and it is um, very uh, structured and organized. Uh, my, my feeling about the mothers has always been that they're strong and that they really try to make a, a good life for themselves and for their children. Uh, I, I made some notes here. I, was, I wanted to make sure that I, I have something to say. Um, sometimes, as, as I look at the family sitting at the tables, I have a feeling that the children uh, see prison as a, a, a pleasant place to be, where they can have a good time. And when they leave their fathers, I don't sense a great sadness uh, from them. And I wonder if it, it makes prison seem like a more pleasant place than they should think it is. That's it. Thank you. Well, um, to speak to that, first I would say that um, I used to see you on Saturday mornings. <laughs> your husband as well. And give out oh, the toys. Oh, bless your heart. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, she I bring those boxes on Saturdays and see you all the time. That's you did right. a wonderful job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, when kids first come to visit their parents, you know, I have I have three children. You know, I have a little daughter and I have two young boys. They're eleven and six. And I'll, I'll return when my son was 10 and my other son was five. So for most of their lives, I was incarcerated. Um, in, the, in the beginning, when they first start visiting me, the beginning of their life, when they're, when, they're, when they're conscious of the fact that their dad is away and when they're leaving their dad, you know, they would cry, they would get emotional. Especially my six-year-old, he would, he would really, really, he has a siren for a voice, so he would, he would cry a lot. But as um, my wife, I need what we say. That May I have your attention, please? The library will be closing in 10 minutes. If you have any items you wish to check out, please bring them to the circulation desk now. The library will be open tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Thank you, and have a good evening. I'll make this brief. Oh, my wife would say <laughs> that, um, that it became our new norm, you know? So children started to recognize this as our normal. Like, we go to school five days a week, I would come home, my mom would be there, my dad would be on the phone at night time, and then on the weekend, we would go see my dad. When we go see the dad, you know, you know, from the father's perspective, you know, we want to parent and, dad, and maybe discipline our children if certain, certain things are happening, but the visit time is not the time for that. You know, I'm going to see my child once a week on the weekend, so no matter what's going on, we're going to make this a joyous time. But the kids, you would see the children playing in the children's center. You see them go by to take the photographs and get the toys and have fun and, and hug their dad and leave them because this is the time where we have to be a family, you know. So, so but being like, I'm being out now, and right now I'm in a situation where I, I, I have gainful employment. I'm blessed to have that, but I travel a lot and, and like, at least twice a month, I'm going to a different state. And so that's time I'm away from my family. So when I'm away from my family, it feels like uh, I'm away again. You know, and my kids are like, when are you coming home? When are you coming home? And so having me there and then me gone, it's a burden. You know, they have many more things than they had before when I was there, but they also lose it a little bit with me being away. So just let's share. We're, um, we are going to wrap it up with one more question, but I, I uh, did want to um, just 
point out the uh, the stories that we're talking about with the uh, incredible contributions of the mothers. Ronin talked about the connection that the mothers had and, and um, the mothers holding together this family to be able to help provide this consistency and, and, and the, norm the normalcy that becomes your family structure. Um, thank you very much. Stephanie is the one who brought this film to our attention. She's a member of the Sing Sing Prison Museum Board and also um, organized and brought to us uh, the weight room, which is the dance performance that's taking place at the waterfront Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. If you haven't gotten your tickets yet, you still can. Just go to Sing Sing Prison Museum. Uh, dot org and it's a suggested donation of twenty five dollars. Anyone who has a family member that if you are prison impacted, please just come and, and we will be very grateful to have you there. Did you have a, a final question? Or you were just telling me to do one last question? Okay. Uh, is there one last question? Otherwise I'll turn it over to our panelists to give us their final thoughts. Okay. And panelists, um, is there a final thought that you would like to have us leave the room with or something that occurred to you that you um, didn't yet have an opportunity to share? Or do you have something going on besides the weight room where I see everybody this, week, this weekend that you wanted to let us know? Um, I'm just going to repeat, I will be at the weight room <laughs> on Saturday. Um, I just want people to open up their minds when they think about people who are incarcerated and how it might affect their children. I also want people to open up their minds because most men who were incarcerated in the 90s are coming home in droves. So we have to accept the fact and be ready for the fact that we have returning citizens coming and they need to come home and um, be able to adjust to society. Uh, I just, I'm sorry, there was a, there was like a, a factual question that I don't know if you or someone in the room can confirm. The block the box legislation had, had, had gotten some traction for a while. Um, do we know where we are with that? And if, and if and block the box was just that you, you cannot ask on a job application um, about people's um, uh, criminal history. And, uh, but I, I don't know where we stand with that, either statewide or is it done at a local level? Do you have any update that you can find us? And it's on a local level, it's scattered to some degree. But um, they can find out. They all have to do is Google. So they can find out. But um, recently, I know I know an individual who um, he he was alone since he was since he was 15. His mom died, and, and his father was a paraplegic, and he took care of his, his father since he was 15. His father passed away when he's about 21, so he's been living on his own for all that time. When he was about 18, he got arrested. And, he had a little, a little minor arrest, he did, a, he did um, some probation, he got off the probation, and flash, fast forward about 38 years later, he became an inspector, um, like a, a building inspector, and they asked him on an application, have you ever been arrested before? Now, that, that was going, he had what's called a certificate of relief of good conduct, when, meaning this shouldn't come up. So we saw that portion on it was on the application when he arrested before. He didn't. He put no. He was an arrested before because he got a certificate of good conduct, so it shouldn't be on his record. It didn't happen 38 years ago. So you know, they gave him back. He was happy. He took a lot of pictures. He's on Facebook. He's doing this great job. Two months after that, he calls me and tells me they terminated his appointment because he lied on the application. So that and just, that happened in New York State, and it's and it's still prevalent and it's still. Dana, I'm sorry, this is our town supervisor, Dana Lever, who obviously is, is better informed about this than I. Dana, what were you going to say? Um, the, the, the box. Don't check the box. I can't remember what the actual wording is for it, but it did pass in Westchester County. It's signed into law in Westchester County, and it is. Um, I don't remember exactly when it is, went into effect, but I know that we've been working with legal counsel to make sure that we eliminate it. Excellent. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, I, I think what I'd like uh, to leave with is um, this uh, understanding of um, the across the lifespan. So for our young people, when we see them uh, exhibiting certain behavior that we will label as antisocial, um, to maybe ask questions. Um, I think in asking questions is where we can find understanding um, and where we can uh, leave a safe space for, for them to maybe share 
what's really going on in their life because maybe there is something about incarceration, maybe there is some other trauma that um, they're holding um, that they need to release. Um, and other, if it's not released, then it can lead to other behavior that then leads to incarceration. And then on the, on the adult side of things, um, as Raneen said, <laughs> as Raneen said, um, when our men are coming, men and women who are coming home, um, they are coming home in droves, and they're coming home ready to re-enter and reintegrate into community and family. And so if we can offer them a safe, place to land, um, then I think we would be much richer for that um, <clears throat> because they have so much to offer. Uh, if, if only we can open our hearts uh, and our minds uh, to them. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to all of our a couple minutes before they kick us out of the library, uh, we ask that the panelists take a picture with the members of the committee so if the document discussion series committee members could join us on the stage and then if you had a question for the panelists, we'll, we'll stop taking their pictures.